We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. This is Cheap Seat Reviews. Hello, and thank you for listening to Cheap Seat Reviews, the podcast that explores the Hollywood film industry for the greater good. I am so excited to have, well, it's a different episode. It's a it's a unique episode. It is an interview. That's right. This is a bonus episode, and this is an interview. And tonight I am talking with T.J. Hill, who is a composer for several things, including my current favorite TV show. And I mean that. I'm not saying that because he's here. I literally mean that right now. Amphibia, the TV series, is my favorite thing. So, T.J., welcome to Cheap Seat, Re- Cheap Seat Reviews. Yeah, thanks for having me. So... I have to be very honest uh, with both you and the listeners. The 75% of the reason why I wanted you on my podcast is because I wanted to impress my kids. (laughs) We watch Amphibia. I mean, it's on right now. My my kids are downstairs. They're having dinner. Uh, Owl House just ended, and now they're watching Amphibia. (laughs) And That's awesome. um, When I... uh, and we listen to the music. We listen to the to the music all the time. It's just kind of on. I have it on my phone. It's just kind of on sometimes. And I thought it would be really cool to reach out to you. So, so that's why I did this. And I am so excited to have you on. And I can't wait for basically to uh, show off to my kids a little bit that I had uh, the composer of their favorite show on my podcast. <laughs> Well, that's yeah. Well, hopefully, I won't uh, won't disappoint them. They'll be like, "Oh, yeah, I liked the show until you talked to that guy." <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sure they won't have anything to do with it. Though they might be a little bummed out when you when you inform them that you don't actually know Sprig, Hop Hop, and that, Anne. Yeah, but. That's true. Although I kind of feel like I do. I sort of live in you know this alternate alternate universe where. I'm just around cartoons all day. So yeah. in my mind, they kind of are real. <laughs> well, that's awesome. That That's really great. So so I want to talk about Amphibia. I want to talk about you, of course. I want to talk about kind of how you um, got your start and some of those kind of generic questions. But I'm just so excited to talk about Amphibia. It's such a great show, and your music is such a big part of that. Can you just tell me about anything about Amphibia, about the – the creative process that you go through, like where you came up with the theme, um, just, you know, the, the, I'm just going to let you go for a while if you want. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I also just love the show. Like even from from the, like when I auditioned for it, it was just, I connected with it right away. And even though I hadn't yet met uh, Matt, the creator of it, I could just sort of like sense that, I kind of knew where he was coming from with it. And um, so, yeah, some of the themes were written in my uh, original audition piece, which was like a three and a half minute little, almost like mock trailer of sorts that kind of had a little bit of scoring and a little bit of montage element. And um, so Anne's theme was actually written at that point, which is kind of one of the main themes throughout the show. But um but yeah, in terms of process, it's a pretty standard um, workflow as far as uh, animated television goes. And so, like, on on a day-to-day, like, once I kind of, like, if you want me to go into, I, I don't want to bore you with too much yeah. detail, but basically after I, after I um, did that audition piece and met Matt, um, and he was like, okay, I think... I think you're our guy. In this case, the show hadn't been greenlit yet. So I had to score the pilot and then they showed it to a bunch of test audiences and kids and whatever. They did a a bunch of, um, you know, whatever that process looks like. So that was actually probably about before the show went into production and got greenlit and all that. Like it was probably about a year and a half in between when I scored the pilot and when it actually went into production and so so that was kind of a weird a weird time because it was like you know you don't want to assume that it's going to get green lit but you really hope it does <laughs> and so um all that to say normal workflow would be i get a uh, full kind of color animation with nearly finished voiceover or you know voice acting and then i have a meeting with uh the director show creator and uh, 
the last two years it's been all virtual, but I used to go up to LA um, every couple of weeks and yeah, you have a spotting meeting and you just kind of watch it. He might point you in a certain direction and um, say, I want this here. I don't want this here. And then he kind of turns me loose for two weeks. And then I have two weeks to score the episode and then we have a meeting to kind of go over it together, and then it's revisions, and then um, once he kind of signs off on it, I export mix files, and and when I turn in one episode, I get another episode, so it's kind of a, um, there's an overlap type situation, but um, yeah, I mean, I'd <laughs> I realize when I say it like that, it sounds kind of boring, but it's not, it's not, it's, it's uh, a lot of work, and especially when you're revising like two episodes and scoring a new one it just you know it gets to be pretty uh pretty all you know all encompassing so all right neat so so you got the uh so you had the idea for and theme right you said and theme or the intro when you did your audition yep and uh, that it was and theme okay and um yeah so th- i think there was maybe one or two other little little themes that have ended up being a part of the show that were in, in that audition piece too, just kind of ended up carrying on throughout the whole series. But sure. um, well, I mean, uh, so obviously the intro is just, uh, for me again, the, the intro itself is just, it, it's funny when my kids started watching the show, right. You know, you know, I'm nearly 40 and watching it. I'm like, and I want to watch what they watch sometimes. Sometimes I can't. But what what caught me was the intro music. I thought, oh, this is interesting. I, I got to get into this. And my wife and I, we watched just the intro, and it was like episode four. And we said, hold on. We got to start at the beginning. This is interesting. And so oh, yeah. we, we went back and watched the whole thing, and so we've been hooked. And so the season two finale, uh, there was not a dry eye in my house. So for those who listen to the show that haven't watched that, that that this show one I think you should it's really it's good it's fun it's a really good show but that scene you know give him back oh my gosh it just gets me oh, yeah. just gets me and so we've watched that episode now probably six or seven times and it wasn't until the last time where I was listening specifically for the music kind of in preparation for this conversation that I realized that you took the the song uh, the the song that she sings in the in the in the America's Got Talent, what was Got Talent? Oh yeah, song. The, uh, no big deal. No big deal. I could I, I couldn't think of the name of the song. No big deal. You took that. Was, no big deal is the is the orchestrated moment during that thing. I was just blown away by that. Like, where was the oh, inspiration yeah. there? That I have to I have to give credit to Matt, um, the show creator. He he knew that he wanted that as as an element. So. He basically said, you know, make this really emotional, really epic. And if possible, you know, he always, he's not like, you have to do this. But he's like, would there be a way to work in the melody of No Big Deal into that? And so I just tried to figure out a way to, like, do that and make it, like, cinematic as opposed to, um, you know, peppy and yeah. and poppy and whatever. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's interesting because I... I probably wouldn't have naturally thought to do that. So it's always fun when you get like, uh, oh, there's the baby sound. (laughs) (laughs) No worries. When you get, um, you know, some input from someone who's, who's coming at it from a different angle. Cause then it causes you to rethink some things. And then you start thinking about the melody and you're like, okay, what, what chords would go with this that would make it sound more like, um, uh, emotional and kind of gut-wrenching and and so that's a fun that's a fun thing like I love when someone else can give me a starting place because it's sort of the like the acorn that turns into the oak tree thing it's like you have the acorn of like I know that this melody needs to be a part of it and so then you start thinking about okay I've got this melody what are some other chord progressions that would go with this um and then you kind of just build out the oak tree from there uh (laughs) no it's a good analogy it totally works i i'm i'm totally tracking with you that's um that's awesome yeah that that scene is so amazing and your music in it is is really great i promise this isn't gonna be 
just me gushing over your music, but I well maybe I can't promise that. Um, <laughs> so I want to I do want to shift gears a little bit away from Amphibia. Maybe we'll come back to it, but because uh, season three we're in the middle of season three right now and just really enjoying the heck out of that and looking forward to uh, this coming this coming Saturday's episode. But um, can you can you kind of talk about where you grew up and um, you know I went I see that you uh, you know you went to, to school for music. I mean I guess you were a music major. I mean kind of kind of talk about that if you don't mind. Yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting because like I I grew up in kind of the Bay Area in California, like about an hour east of San Francisco. People who live in like San Francisco would argue that maybe it's not technically the Bay Area, but we we claimed that it was. Um, but uh, yeah, my mom is a music teacher, um, or she just retired a couple years ago. So um, I guess she what. I guess you're always a music teacher, but yes, she, yes. you know, she's a retired music teacher. Um, and so music was always a big, a, a big thing in our house. And, um, and my dad is a retired minister. And so I grew up like with a lot of music education stuff. And then I grew up playing a lot of music in church and stuff like that. And so, um, that was kind of, I don't know where I cut my teeth was just like playing on at church and forming bands with other kids from like the youth group and, and stuff like that. Um, and, and yeah, so I just sort of, I was just kind of a guy who played music and I got really into, um, you know, did piano lessons as a kid, but then I, that was kind of the like thing we did in our family. It was like, all right, you, all the kids learn piano and I liked it. Okay. But it wasn't like, I found my thing. And then in fifth grade, I started playing drums and guitar. And then that was when like the light, the lights came on and pretty much from fifth grade (laughs) to now it's been all music all the time. Um, and so, yeah, I I was gonna actually study mechanical engineering in school because I've always been like a more technically focused and, you know, kind of a a geek in that way. But, um, I had, I had this opportunity to write music for this like little mini musical involving like 60 people in like sheep costumes. And it was just (laughs) this ridiculous thing. And, um, this, another light bulb moment, like after the, after I finished that, I was just like, okay, this, I think like, this is what I want to, do like just you know writing music for whatever um films tv whatever people want me to write music for and so um that's when I kind of shifted my focus from I I had basically just started uh just finished high school at that point I was like okay let's let's switch to music this is like what I really love you know so um yeah, I don't. Uh, so that's kind of the background, and then, long story short, I kind of in college started uh, studying at St- uh, San Diego State, which is I live in San Diego still, but um, they had a program called electroacoustic music composition that was a mixture of like classical composition, but also computers and uh, stuff like that nerdery (laughs) so it was a good (laughs) mixture for me um and so that was kind of my focus at school and then um in college I started playing with a band that was um from San Diego called Future of Forestry and kind of a ambient rock kind of uh multi-instrumentalist type band um and uh through the band met a guy who I eventually started playing guitar for and he um he's now like a good friend of mine but he writes he does a lot of things but he writes a lot of uh songs for for kids shows like um like most notably I like to tell people he uh he and his writing partner wrote the the theme song for Paw Patrol which is pretty cool yeah Um, that is cool and so it's like but he's just this really amazing guy who um, needed a, a, a guitar player. And so he would start sending me all these, um, 
usually for kids TV, like, uh, like blaze and the monster machines, which is like a Nickelodeon show. Mm -hmm. And, um, the newer veggie tales, which was on Netflix and stuff like that. Like he would be like, Hey, I want a guitar. So he'd send it to me. And, and then, um, yeah, at one point he said, Hey, this, this audition came in for like a, a cartoon. Um, it's not really in my wheelhouse, but I think you could kill it. Like, can I, um, put you in touch with my manager? And so he introduced me to, uh, Molly, who's now my manager. And she basically started sending me pitches that came in from, you know, places like Disney TVA and the sort of, Hey, we're looking for a composer, but they, they usually don't go super wide. They kind of go to their network of managers so that they don't get like a million submissions. It's like a way to, you know, narrow it a little bit. So anyway, so from college, <laughs> got involved with this band, met this guy who uh, introduced me to my now manager and just kind of one of those, I just sort of found myself um, working in animation, but I wasn't, it ended up just being this really good fit because of my eclectic background but I don't think I had ever thought about like, oh, I should write music for like animated series. Like it wasn't something I was thinking about like in high school or college. It just kind of like crept up on me. And then it was like another one of those light bulb moments <laughs> where I was watching some shows. I think I was watching like some old Phineas and Ferb to just like see kind of what because I, you know, I hadn't watched cartoons since since I was a kid. I was like watching this and it was just this frenetic kind of like switching gears all the time. Like there's a little 10 second emotional section and then it's into like a speed metal moment. And then I was like, this is perfect for me because <laughs> I've just, you know, I've always been a little bit like um, just, I like lots of different types of music. And so uh, it was like, Oh, I think this is going to be a really good fit for me. Um, because of all of the eclectic musical needs of a show. So anyway, I don't know if that answered the question or if that was just a huge tangent, but that was, that's kind of the, the slightly boring, but not as boring as it could be long, <laughs> but not too long version. No, that was perfect. Uh, no, that's great. Um, uh, most people that are listening to this, who listen to me regularly know this. So I was a music major also. Oh, nice. um, I played brass. I was a euphonium major. And my dad was a music director, um, also retired. He he taught band, high school band and middle school band for 30 years. No way. Yeah. Um, and so when I went to college, I wanted to be a band director. And then I took one semester of that and said, nope, and, <laughs> and switched to music industry. So I have a recording oh, nice. degree, recording arts degree. And so my 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 dream is interesting. You talk about you kind of cut your teeth like a church and stuff like that. That was kind of the goal for me was to go to Nashville and uh, record music. Uh, wasn't in the cards. Ended up going to a town called Wilmington, North Carolina, which is like, so at the time in the early aughts, there were three main places where you were going to film in um, the United States. Obviously, uh, Vancouver was starting to kind of get their film scene. Uh, New Orleans a little bit had a film scene, but Katrina wiped most of it out. Uh, oh, so, yeah. so we went Wilmington, North Carolina, obviously New York and L.A. And so Wilmington was getting a lot of production. And so I went there and made TV shows and movies and things like that. All real low-budget stuff. Um, but I had a good time doing it. So anyway. Oh, that's awesome. It was, uh, it was fun. Uh, so when I, when I tell people that I play euphonium, most people have no idea what that means. But... Oh yeah, I I know exactly what a euphonium yeah. is. Um, I am a frustrated um, trombonist. Okay. So I I have a trombone and I aspire to be better at it than I am. But um, I just fell in love with it in college, and I just I love brass so much. But um, it's I think I just need to, you know, when people ask me about. Like, hey, what what's your recommendation for like getting good at the guitar or whatever? I I say like, well, you know, build build the fundament fundamentals, start slow, play slow, clean, and like the speed and proficiency will come. And then I get on the trombone. I'm just like, man, I just want to play fast 
and loud and beautifully, but all I can do is these horrible honking, <laughs> you know, notes. But um, so in Amphibia, there's actually a number of moments where I played actual trombone, but it was always moments where it didn't need to be like good. <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense. You know, it's like, because uh, there's a lot of funny little musical stings and like things like that where it's like, okay, I can do that, yeah. you know. But a, a super emotional, like, soaring brass part, not not in the cards for me at this point. Not so. in the cards. Um, I am curious, how much of the score is, like, actual orchestra and how much of it is uh, MIDI or electronic? Yeah, that's a good question. So basically with the speed and budgets that that are at play with like um animated TV, I'm sort of a one-stop shop. So they, you know, they come to me and they're sort of like we don't care how it gets done. It just I mean they don't they care, but like, you know, they're just sort of like you're the music guy, however it happens happens. So like if I ever did want to hire, you know, horn players or string players or whatever, then I just have to sort of pay them as subcontractors. Mm -hmm. Um, And so for Amphibia, basically every instrument that I don't play is um, done via like MIDI and samples and stuff like that. So basically as much of the percussion as possible and, um, and, guitars obviously and mandolin banjo stuff like that glockenspiel vibraphone that's all just stuff that i play and then um but when it comes to like orchestral strings and brass and stuff like that um my template's kind of a hybrid where it's part midi and part um part real instruments if that makes sense it does no that that makes sense um it I think having at least some of it makes it feel more real. Um, and also, yeah. MIDI has gotten so good. I mean, the technology has gotten so good. I mean, when I was learning MIDI in college, again, that was 05, it didn't sound great, you know? So whenever oh, yeah. you would hear, like, a film score using using that, it was not quite 80s style, but it, it had a it had a different effect. So that's... That's really cool to know that you do that. Well, if you ever need a euphonium solo, you know a guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Even in the last 10 years, I just feel like um, samples have really come a long way. And it's getting to the point now where even when I go see a film or I'm watching a TV show, I can't, like, most of the time I can't really tell, you know. Yeah. It's, I, I don't, in in I actually don't, usually want to know it's like i just want to get sucked into the music and it's like obviously it's more um sexy to think about a hundred piece orchestra with john williams at the helm you know in some studio than it is to see like a nerdy guy just like plunking away at a keyboard but um but at the end of the day it's all about you know if it sounds good and if it um captures the emotion of the of the thing you're trying to score so yeah no, I, I totally with you. Totally with you. Um, okay. Well, since you 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 um you uttered the name the the name the the unholy John Williams, uh, I'm just curious, who is your favorite film composer? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, you have to acknowledge John Williams yeah. as he's kind of one of the the goats, as they say, yeah. the greatest greatest of all time. Um. It's interesting because sometimes I try not to listen to lots of other film scores because they'll sort of, they'll do a couple things in me. They'll make me feel like, oh, you know, I suck. (laughs) Um, If it's like a really good composer, it's like, oh no, you know, it's like, how how the heck do they do that? Um, And then also it's like, I would almost rather listen to like, older like cla- like stuff from the classical catalog so like i i get a lot of inspiration from like people like rimsky korsakov and you know i feel like every composer on earth has probably taken some stuff from scheherazade um yeah but like claude debussy and stuff like that I- i'll find myself listening to a lot more of that type of stuff than actual film scores but um 
in terms of people that I really like, a um, couple of people come to mind. Uh, you know, it's I guess it sounds kind of cliche to to say this, but especially when I was in college and just kind of starting to explore the world of scoring, um, Danny Elfman was a, a big influence, and he also. Oh. I always liked his approach to things because he kind of was the just sort of rock band musician guy turned composer, which like, even though I like studied it in school, it was still, I was just sort of like a guy who played music who then started getting into this. So I just would like listen to the, the film, the score from big fish specifically. Mm -hmm. And I just, I still just love that score. I think it's, it's genius. Um, and then another guy who I like, I haven't kept up with him. I assume he's still probably active, but is uh, Aaron Zygman. And he did, um, especially at the time, he was really known for his work on The Notebook, um, which was just a really beautiful score. Um, I'm trying to remember what else he did. Uh, he had a, uh, there was a film, I forget who's in it. It might have been like John Cusack or something. It was called Martian Child. Does that ring a bell? Um, I'm looking through here. I'm on his uh, IMDb page. Oh yeah. Uh, let's see. He might have done one of the uh, one of the horse movies, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, like Flicka or something. Sorry, we, we, I don't remember he that. Did, let's see, Bridge to Terabithia. Yeah, he did Flicka. You're right. Um, Alpha Dog, uh, The Notebook. John Q was his first film. That's a good movie. Um, Oh, I don't know if I've seen that one. I should. Uh... Yeah, John Q. Well, uh, it's um, it's like the it's like um, I don't want to give much of the plot, but basically, it's a guy who takes over a hospital because our healthcare system is terrible. Oh, interesting. Yeah, um, stars um, um, uh, Denzel Washington. Oh, okay. Uh, um, yeah, okay. His stuff, though, I like specifically, um, like if you've never listened to just the soundtrack of the Notebook. You know, it's kind of known as, you know, being a little bit of a, a little bit more of a chick flick, but it's, you have to admit, it's a, just emotionally, it's just a very powerful film. And the music, I think, plays a, a huge role in that. And with Martian Child, it was just this kind of subtle, but really beautiful kind of, um, I don't know, melancholy, just, I don't, I don't know. I just, I, I, for some reason, just really liked those two. They, and Martian Child wasn't like a huge, like, you know, it wasn't like Star Wars or something. It was more kind of understated and and pretty. But, um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Why can't I think of this composer? I, I In high school, I really, really liked the score to A Beautiful Mind. Was that, um, I just remember I would put that on. It was on uh, James Horner. Yeah. James Horner. There yeah, you I should have done that too. <laughs> oh yeah, James Horner is amazing. He's one of my favorites, yeah. also. So, um, yeah, those are some kind of just people who stand out. But um, and then I kind of get into some of the like the like funkier like. Let me. I'm gonna actually open my Spotify because I want to find who this this guy is. Another show I worked on, the director would always like reference this uh, really quirky kind of 50s guy, um, Nelson Riddle. Are you familiar with Nelson Riddle I'm not, at all? No. Um, if you ever just, just want to like put on some kind of funky, quirky music from, <laughs> from yesteryear, just check out some Nelson Riddle, but it's, it's not necessarily like traditional, you know, you wouldn't think of it as film score, but it's really quirky kind of fun stuff. And and so I've always been attracted to that kind of the quirky side of things too. So I also like um Mark Mothersbaugh and um he's I would say he's kind of a I can never say his last name, but um <laughs> Alexander Desplat, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. A lot of the Wes Anderson stuff was really kind of probably a big influence on me. But um yeah, and then probably one of my just all-time favorites, uh, he's you know a composer, but a lot of his stuff is used in film, is um, Aaron Copeland. You, know, you just oh, got to yeah. acknowledge Aaron Copeland. He's just, I used to get, uh, my composition teacher would always kind of make fun of me 
because I would always try to write these things that were like big, soaring, emotional things. And he wanted me to write like, you know, atonal, uh, <laughs> you know, stuff that's never been heard before. And he'd always like make fun of me for being like middle of the road or whatever. And so, but it, I think it was just because I just admired Copeland so much. And there was something about that kind of Americana, big sky sound that just really captured me in college. So, uh, yeah. No, then <laughs> again, I'm the type of guy I had a, a teacher once tell me like, uh, it, you know, encouraging me to keep my answers brief. He said, um, TJ, you're the kind of guy who, when I ask what time it is, you tell me how to build a watch. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to rein that in uh, with my answers. But um, yeah, but see, you know, that so doesn't work so well on an interview podcast, you know, where like the sole purpose of you being here is to talk. <laughs> so I'm. Yeah, you're like, do you like music? Yes. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. This would have, this interview would have <laughs> ended a long time ago. No, this is, um, yeah. no, this is great. And it's interesting that you do listen to some of the classics. Uh, and I was I was the same way because um, when I first started really listening to... I, mean, I, I listened to classical music growing up. Again, when you're the son of a band director, that's what you listen to in the car, right? I didn't, oh, I didn't yeah. grow up listening to 80s and 70s rock. I listened to NPR and, you know, Gustav Holst and, um, <laughs> you know, like, like uh, those guys were my... That's what they were my childhood, right? So, yeah. um, so it was really interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm very similar to that too. Uh, just kind of listening to that stuff. Though I I typically listen to, and this is totally my bias, uh, but I typically listen to music, uh, 20th century classical. So, like I said, like Ray Fon Williams or Gustav Holtz, whatever. Oh yeah. Basically, everything since the euphonium was invented is kind of. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of yeah. You know, like the fact when that the there's a euphonium solo in. Like second sweet enough, or in Mars, um, and every time, every now and then, I'll hear it in a film, and I, I will like literally like smack my wife in the arm. She's like, "Okay, I hear it stop." You know, like in um, <laughs> at the end of Pirates of the Caribbean three, you know, Hans Zimmer puts a euphonium solo, and I, I, I was like clapping in the theater. You know, I was so excited. Oh yeah. yeah so, <laughs> uh, uh, what what year was euphonium? Like when did it first kind of burst onto the scene? Because I that's not a fact factoid that I remember. Sure. So okay, we're gonna really bore our listeners now. So Adolf Sax, <laughs> who invented the saxophone, also was in part uh, invented the the euphonium. There's a couple other guys, but he's kind of the main dude that what invented it. And we're in 1890s, 18 you know oh, okay. 1900s. Um, it's it's a fairly new instrument in as far as the brass family goes. They just needed something that had the voice of the cello, but oh yeah, but for band for winds because it's what it is. That's why there's almost zero euphonium in orchestra because it's the same voice as the cello. Oh, I never thought of it that way, but that yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, anyway, see, we we both learned something new today. How's that? <laughs> yeah, totally. I was gonna joke about in like seventh grade we had we didn't have enough trombone players and I always played um you know drums or or bass or guitar and jazz band but they would have uh trumpet players learn the valve trombone as like to fill the mm -hmm. the kind of trombone part but it was always sort of like they were always seen as like imposter trombone <laughs> players you know because you couldn't do any slides or that kind of thing. So anyway, for some reason, I was just thinking, it, like, thinking about brass made me just remember fondly the valve trombone. So well, we're gonna get into the weeds a little bit. So when I I picked euphonium from sixth grade because my mom had one at the house, and that's what her instrument was. So dad played French horn, mom could play French horn too, but she also had a baritone. And so I walk into sixth grade and I pull my baritone out, and you know, sixth grade there's like thirty eight trumpets. And five, five oh, yeah. of them said, I want to switch to that. Whoa. So we were like one of the few, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade bands that had four euphonium players or baritone players because, and that's why baritone treble clef is a thing. It's because you have too many trumpet players, so you move them to baritone. Uh, ah. it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's why it's a thing. I mean, I, I remember getting to eighth grade. I moved, got to eighth grade and uh, walk in with my baritone. And again, two trumpet players like, I want to learn that. And the teacher said, well, I don't have time to teach you 
Sean, you have to teach them. So I had to teach these kids <laughs> how to play the baritone. It's pretty fun. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, well, I don't really have a whole lot of other questions. Um, we've kind of covered over a lot of a lot of ground here, um, which is great. I uh, I did want to ask you specifically: Do you have because you talked about composers? Is there a specific score, both TV or film, that you like or love a little bit more than the others? Let's see. I know um, that's a tough one. You know, it's that, that's a tough. Oh thing, yeah. You know? I mean, I already mentioned um, Big Fish. Yeah. That one just, especially the end. There's just this kind of this cue in the movie just. That towards the end that just it just the builds to the emotional culmination of the film and it's just I just remember driving I had it cranked up in my car in college and I was just sobbing it was just it was moving me like so much you know yeah. um and this is this is maybe controversial because I know a lot of people for whatever reason really don't like <laughs> don't like this guy but I also grew up on um on Andrew Lloyd Webber, like Phantom of the Opera. Sure. So I, I, obviously that's not a film score. It's a musical, but the mov- the music from that um, production is just kind of baked into my brain, uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately. But um, yeah, and I think, you know, I like my dad collects like old editions of Lord of the Rings. And so when those movies started coming out, it was like, the most exciting thing ever for our family. Cause we grew up with the books and we were steeped in kind of the lore. <laughs> and then these huge films come out with just gorgeous, um, just a gorgeous score. So I would say, yeah, the, the L O T R yeah. scores are definitely like, were, or probably a big influence on me, like in, in my high school years. Um, yeah. I mean, you have to acknowledge Star Wars. Like, yeah. that's just that's just in my brain, you know. Um, yeah, those are probably the the standouts. People are sometimes uh, surprised at how few movies I've seen. Like, I don't, you know, I I watch movies, I guess, a fair amount, but I, I there's a lot of classic films that I haven't yet seen. So I feel like I still have a lot of. Um, <laughs> learning to do sure i would say well yeah i mean you know you got time plus you know you you got a kid so now you have all the time in the world right yeah exactly well but it i guess it'll give me the opportunity to like as um as she grows up to like maybe revisit some of those films or there's experience them for the first time with her or something there, there is nothing more magical than than reliving moments of your childhood with your kid you know like i said my my son is nine. Now, I know it's impossible unless you show it to her at a really young age, but my son ruined the the greatest cinematic, you know, plot twist in the history of film with No, I Am Your Father. He he knew about it before we watched Star Wars, and I was so mad at him because he he robbed himself of that moment. Um <laughs> Because my co-host, he has he has daughters, uh, and he watched them for the first time uh, when his oldest was eight, and when he got to know I am your father, her jaw dropped. It was amazing. It was this amazing moment, and like he loves to tell that story. And I was so mad at my son, like you ruined this moment. Um, <laughs> but we've gotten to watch we've watched most of the Star Wars films together, and it, it's really fun. I'm I'm really I know your daughter's very young. Um, but it, it's a really fun experience, you know, especially when she starts getting old enough to watch some of those old cartoon movies. You know, I, you know, like my kids love, um, we just watched the other night, the iron, the iron giant, like that's a favorite. Oh yeah. Uh, it's a great film. Uh, they love the Fievel movies. Well, they love Fievel goes West and that's James Horner. And I have that musical. On my oh phone. yeah. Um, so it's, it, we, uh, yeah. we talk about that movie quite a bit in in this house because sometimes if I don't know if this happens to you but sometimes like if you have a friend or family member who's talking about moving and they're like oh I want to move to I don't know and they'll uh, Port Arthur Texas they'll say some random place and then you know when you're 
excited about moving somewhere, you tend to focus on all of the like exciting things about it. So it's like, oh, you know, in in Dinuba, California, dog walkers make like five hundred thousand dollars a year. And you're like, that can't be true. Um and so when when friends or family are talking about all of the um <laughs> the exciting things about the place you're about to move to, we'll just kind of later go like there are no cats in america <laughs> so and the streets are filled with cheese yeah, oh with yeah cheese. i know the song yeah. i was gonna say though did your son know the proper quote did he know that it was no i am your father uh, i assume you probably baked that you didn't teach him that it was luke i am your I father right because that's yeah. like one of those Mandela effect things. Right. right. I don't know if he knew it or not, but if I if I were to go downstairs or call him upstairs right now and say, Declan, what is if my son's name's Declan, I'll say, What is the line that Darth Vader says? He would probably say it correctly. Um Okay. Yeah, that's impressive as a nine year old. Yeah, well, he has one of those memories, kinda like me, which I don't envy, is that I can remember a movie quote from a movie I saw once five years ago. But I can't remember oh, where wow. my jacket is. Um, <laughs> that's that's a yeah. That's just it's just a weird th- thing that it, it doesn't help me at all. It's just one of those things. But he's he's kind of the same way. Uh, like one of those other fun Mandela effects is the you know Scotty beam me up. It's never uttered ever. Scotty beam me up. Oh, never, interesting. Never says that. He might or beam me up, Scotty. That's the phrase. Beam me up, Scotty. Oh yeah. He never says that. He might say Scotty beam me up, but. <laughs> Usually oh, okay. it's just enterprise, you know. You just you just talk to the ship, and then the ship beams you up. Um, anyway, uh, well, that's really cool. Um, th- thank you for sharing those moments. Yeah, film film scores are kind of a personal thing uh, when you're talking about your favorite kind of music. Uh, and tastes change, you know. I mean, if you would have asked me uh, two years ago, I would have said probably How to Train Your Dragon. I love that score. You know. John, oh yeah, that's a, that was a great. John one. Powell is so amazing. But right now, I'm in this kick where. If you want to elicit an emotion from me, you play the the Hans Zimmer track from um, Spirit. It's called Spirit. Spirit. The, oh the, yeah, 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 yeah. Spirit. Okay. That's what it's called. Um, that I don't know if I've heard that one. I feel like I should uh, I should check that out. Um, yeah, it's it's really great. Um, it's really great. I, I it uh, there's a the the cue called uh, Run Free. Run, I'm gonna write that down because I want to. Yeah, check that out. run free. You listen to it on those nice headphones you got there. I mean, it'll it, it gives me goosebumps every time. It makes me want to just weep with joy, thinking about like if you imagine because I've never seen the movie. I've not seen the movie. Oh, yeah. All I can think about is what it's like to be free. You know, yeah. and like that's what the music just that's the emotion that the music is telling me. Um. Oh, I'm gonna definitely. Definitely listen to that later. Yeah. Um, yeah, Hans is one of those, like, just other people you can't not acknowledge as being an influence because he's just so in the cultural zeitgeist. And you always hear his stuff. Like, I, I remember um, I was working on, like, a small, like, independent film, like, in college or something with a friend. And we were trying to work on this, like, culmination, this big emotional or big, like, battle scene or, so, you know, some kind of big cinematic moment. And we were like, well, let's get some inspiration. So we like popped on one of the pirates' scores, yeah. and we just lit, we blasted it on these like nice monitors that my friend had, and um, and we both just sat there. We just got really depressed because you hear that, and then you you flip back to like Pro Tools and hit play on this epic cue you thought you were working on, and it just sounds like garbage. <laughs> and you're just like, oh, why did we do that? You know, it's like. That's what happens when you like listen to a big Hans score and then immediately go back to the thing you thought was like the most epic thing I've ever written. And you realize it just sounds small and it sounds like the, it's the equivalent of like hearing an orchestra and then going back to like a a Casio keyboard in the eighties. It's just like, Oh no. So anyway, yeah. Hans is, Hans is a legend. Yeah, no, he, he he is. I mean, you know, the Crimson Tide score is one of my favorites. And uh, I, I did he do? He didn't do Hunt for Red October. He did, did not. He? That was Basil, right? Basil. Um, oh, Paul and yeah, Paul Duras. Right. Paul and Duras. I'm saying his name wrong. 
I yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know either, but um That was him. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Yeah, it. he did hunt, but yeah, you know, uh Zimmer did. Uh he did, you know, the the he didn't do the first pirates. He did the rest of them. Um That's right. It was Klaus Bladelt. Uh what yeah. Yeah, he did that. I mean, and and everyone knows it. It's not, you know, he's one of those guys. He's an orchestrator for Zimmer. I mean, it Everyone knows he basically just said, "Hey, I'm just gonna take your theme from Gladiator and just turn it into a pirate movie." Sure, go for it. I mean, it's <laughs> it's you know, if you listen to the cue, the battle, like when they're attacking the beginning of the movie with the German forces, or the the scene in the um, in the arena when Maximus is kind of fighting the other gladiators, it's it's Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, it's just it is. Uh, uh, yeah, interesting. So those are. Well, it's like the uh, what's the what's the quote? Originality is the art of concealing your source. Yeah. You know? So. <laughs> uh, well, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I've kind of run out of uh, questions that I wanted to ask. Is there anything else that you just want people to know? I mean, like, I mean, I know you're not going to tell me plot points about Amphibia because I wouldn't want to know them anyway. I'm just so much in, <laughs> in enjoying the show and seeing where it goes. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I would just I would say there's a lot of fun stuff I would say to uh to look forward to in season 3 and um Yeah, I guess I mean regarding Amphibia specifically, it's just been like such a pleasure to work on that on that show and even even down to some of the like voice um acting talent. Like I my favorite cartoon growing up was a Goofy movie. Yeah. Um and you know, the voice of Hot Pop is goofy. And so at the Amphibia um, kind of premiere party, uh, he was there. <laughs> so I got to meet him and I was like, he was probably like weirded out at how how much I was fanboying over <laughs> him. But um, I was just like, hey, Bill, um, I, I'm writing music for the show and I just... I just love goofy movie and can I take a picture with you? And so there was just all these kind of serendipitous moments throughout, throughout the series that just made it a really good fit for me. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you've connected with it too, because, um, one of the sort of directives that, that you'll often get, especially in the Disney camp is they'll say like, even on their priest, I've worked on a, a show for Disney junior for them. And one of the directives is like, just write music. Don't think this is for kids. You know, don't think like this is just, especially in the preschool stuff. They're like, we don't want to drive the parents insane. Just kind of do your thing. And so, um, yeah, it's just cool to hear that you've connected with it as well as your kids. Cause I love the yeah. show. Like, I think I would watch it even if I wasn't working on it. I would just, cause it's just funny and fun and there's a lot of heart in it which sounds kind of cliche but i feel like it's it's really true it's like and getting to know matt and his kind of mo it's just like just makes me love the show and the characters that much yeah. more that's awesome uh last thing and then i'll, I'll uh, let you go is um do you have any advice for anyone that is trying to break into the industry to do this kind of thing to be you know a, a composer yeah, I mean, I will caveat my advice by saying I feel like I'm still kind of learning like <laughs> what the heck I'm doing. So, um don't maybe take any of this too seriously, but um but I would say like maybe I'll keep it at three things cuz I I don't want to bore you too much. But one would be um like it's good to learn to separate the sort of what I'll call kind of the sacred work of like your art, like creating something from nothing, like putting a lot of your self and your emotions into your music, separating that from uh, the, the business aspect of the industry. Because if you get those things too, in, you know, intertwined, then whenever you get feedback, which you definitely will, and you get notes that are like, hey, can you change this? Or like, this didn't quite land for me. You have to be able to go, okay, that's like my job is to, you know, 
write music for this specific thing. And if I get all, that's my baby, that's my, you know, do you have any idea how much, how many tears I cried over my keyboard as I played in those notes? Or, like, I, I mean, I'm just being hyperbolic here, but um, like, if you, the more that that happens to you, it's just showing that you're like, not doing the job like the job is to be like okay i was really attached to this but it needs to change you know and so then you can kind of you you unashamedly put a lot of your heart and soul into your music and then once you send it off like in a healthy way disconnect from it and be like okay now i did my best and i know i'm gonna get some notes on it and just know that that's like the business of it but it doesn't mean that um Whenever you get feedback on on your work, it doesn't necessarily mean that you yourself are bad or something. It just means that, you know, you, there might have been a, a slight, like, mismatch between what you were thinking and what the director was thinking. And so it's okay to, to think of those as separate things. Um, number two would be these days I feel like being really up to speed on the technical side of things is really important. Um, just because you end up almost needing to be really good at things like computer networking and figuring out how to, you know, build these ridiculously complicated scoring rigs that involve multiple computers and ethernet and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so, I think there's a lot of people who get into music purely for the art side of it and the creative side. And when it comes to being like a modern, like scoring person, like, like scoring for picture, you almost have to become a super techie, uh, person. <laughs> um, that's not always the case, but that's probably, that's, almost a prerequisite now. And then lastly, I would say like, I think a lot of people um, when they have an opportunity to pitch for something, they will try to give the people what they think they want, as opposed to doing what they would naturally do, if that makes sense. And so you end up with like, especially let's say that you had an opportunity to like audition for a Disney show you start thinking, I'm going to give them the Disney magic and it's all, you know, wind chimes and, and Tinkerbell. And, you know, you're trying to like give them the Disney magic, but what they want is to just find someone who naturally writes the type of music that they connect with. And so I always like to tell people like, you know, that kind of weird quirky thing that you feel like isn't the Disney magic. It's like a something that you would just naturally do maybe lead with that because usually like people who are like looking for a composer for their project don't want someone who's just gonna like sound like what you know they don't want like the quote-unquote like cliche thing like they just want you to be you and if it's a good fit it's a good fit and then the bonus with that is you don't have to like spend your whole time working on the project pretending you're something you're not. You're just kind of, you're just kind of making the music you would normally make and they hired you to do that. So, um, yeah, I don't know if any of that <laughs> helps or makes sense, but, um, but I, that's just been some of my observations. Awesome. No, that works. That's fine. That's great. Um, and I think that can be uh, pretty useful for, I think most walks of life as well. Um, uh, yeah. Basically, everything you just said is how is kind of what I tell tell people when they ask me about getting into podcasting. That's very oh, yeah. similar. It's you know it's it's a different kind of art form. Just uh, I think mine's a lot easier than yours, but uh, and no one pays me, so there's that too. Uh, well, but I I feel like the the kind of dirty secret about things that other people find hard is that like my guess is that like it would cut it comes easy to you but if i was to try to do it i'd probably be like this is impossible how do you do this you know but it's like the things that you're passionate about don't feel hard to you but then to other people they seem like incredibly sure. difficult 
So I have a surprise guest for you, TJ. I want you to meet okay. my son. Come here. Oh, nice. Put these headphones in, pal. Be like, come over here. Oh, Oop, I just bumped into something. <laughs> so he is your target market, your target uh, audience here. Okay. So. Hey, hey, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. It's Declan, yeah. right? Nice. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. So, again, he wrote the score, the music, to Amphibia. I wanted you to see, you know, again, this is who you're writing this music for, because you know, do you love the Amphibia score? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, what else are you going to say, right? I got you on a microphone. Anyway. <laughs> so, I just I just thought this would be kind of a cool moment, so. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you like it. You like it? Yeah. Who's your favorite? Do you have a favorite character? Mm, honestly, I don't. I mean, I like um, Marcy. Yeah, oh, yeah. I like Marcy a lot. Miss Briggs. Yeah, yeah, she's pretty cool. She's like, I like that she's kind of, um, she's cool and she's smart. Yeah. You know what I mean? A lot of times the cool kid isn't the smart yeah. one. But I feel like she's this good mix of the both, yeah. you know? Which, it, of the three, like, main girls, like, who do you identify most with? Like, are you, are you, like, a smart, you seem like maybe you're a smart kid. Yeah, I'm the smart kid, yeah. Or are you, like, do you, like, ride a motorcycle and I stuff don't, like that? Like, I don't ride a motorcycle. <laughs> I don't have a license for that. Oh, okay, gotcha. Cool. That's right. cool. Yeah, I, I would say I probably see myself as, as a, a Marcy. Yeah. All right, thanks. What about you, Sean? Do you have a? Would you be an Anne, a Marcy, or a Sasha? Uh, uh, or maybe I should ask Declan. What would what your What do dad you think? Be? Who, which which character am I? You would probably be. I know. I know what he wants to say. He wants what? to say I'm more like Hop Hop. You kind of are. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're Wally. I'm Wally. Yes, what? you're Wally. Do you? Oh, here's a here's a quiz for you. Do you remember Wally's full name? Um, I don't know the middle name, but I know it's Wally. R not, I think it's his last name is Rivington. I know that. Yep. He's. I don't know if he has a middle name, but I was just they call it, it's Wally is short for Walliam. Yeah, which Walliam. I thought was just hilarious. <laughs> yeah, Walliam. Walliam Rivington. Our yeah. It's funny. We always say in our house. Um, there's a scene in, I think it's season one where the the like corn thief episode oh, yeah i don't know if you remember that there's the scary like corn pumpkin yeah. monster and they're in the cornfield and hot pop says like my prize winning corn and uh ann says like whoa hot pop your corn has won prizes and he goes it's an expression ann <laughs> so we like to say it's an expression ann in our house <laughs> all right well thanks bud you want to tell him bye 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 yeah nice to meet you they're getting ready to go to bed, but oh, I thought nice. it would be kind of cool. Thanks, bud. Yeah, that was. I that might was keep awesome. that in the. Sh I might keep that. I don't know, but um. Yes, keep it. Okay, he wants me to keep it for the thing. <laughs> I, I, I think, think I should. should too. Um, that was fun. Uh, well, thank you so much. This has been an absolute tr uh, treat for me. Um, uh, for, to have you on the show, I, I really appreciate it. If there's any, uh, you know, socials you want people to know how to get a hold of you or anything like that. Yeah. Um. I mean, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm not the most active person on there, but it's just at TJ Hill. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I'm sort of hit or miss with that kind of stuff, but um, I always aspire to be more, like, connected on it. But, um, oh, yeah, and when it comes out, I'll, I'll definitely throw it out there on in the Twitter sphere because there's a lot of, of random um, just people that I'm connected with on there that are – have connected with me because of the yeah. show. So hopefully they'd find it, um, you know, that would be very cool. That'd be very <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I, I follow a lot of, uh, you know, uh, amphibia fan arts and, and things like that. And it's a, it's a pretty cool community. Um, that was pretty eye opening for me too. Like, cause, um, you know, have being relatively new to the, to the television animation world, it was just overwhelming to see the response when the show got out there and, and, the the fan art and stuff like that is just it's crazy how it connects with so many people it's just a good reminder of how wide reaching like these shows are you know because sometimes i forget about that i'm just like a guy in a room just making music yeah. 
and then you see like people from all over the world sending their like fan art into the show creator to see it and like oh yeah yeah this like is getting out there it's pretty cool well i think um and i can't remember his name but there's a there's a, a i guess you can call him an arranger on youtube that has taken your music and done like what they call the epic uh oh yeah yeah um they, that person has reached out to me a couple of times and like um been like check out this thing and that's always a trip yeah. cuz because just the thought of somebody like taking the time to learn learn it and stuff it's just like wow you know it's it's always it feels like such a huge honor because like I said I don't you know I just see myself as some random guy in a room making music and so it's a good reminder that it it does connect with people and so that's always super humbling yeah. I, and I I love that YouTube channel his his stuff is great and uh, on more than one occasion that has been the soundtrack to our dinner <laughs> oh, it's that's it's awesome. really good stuff he's really great um, well. Again, I say thank you so much, and uh, that's going to do it for us here at Cheap Seat Reviews. Again, uh, thank you so much to TJ Hill for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. And as always, you can go to our website, cheapseatreviews.libsyn.com. There you can find links to all of our other social media platforms, including our merch store. Please go buy some merch from us. Also, if you would leave a review for us on iTunes or Spotify, that would be great. Uh, reviews really help us, uh, you know, let other people find us and spread the word. So on behalf of TJ Hill, this is Sean saying thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time. This is Cheap Seat Reviews.